No worries, Daniel. Um, I will make sure to keep our chat window open so that if you need to use um, need to use the chat, then that's what you do. It's not a problem. Um, all right, so I need to um, jump into our room. I'm just I'm gonna stand up for a little bit because I'm sitting down so much. Ah. Uh, what am I trying to do? Oh, okay. I need to log in uh, via my tablet. Um, okay, so while I'm doing that, let me um, tell you a couple things that I think are um, uh, of use to everyone. Uh, one is that the um, I'm in the process of um, adding, I, I, which I have to do manually, the extra credit from exam one. So I'm such a noodle head that it's like I had to figure out, now, how many points do I need to do that? Uh, right, so anyway, I figured it out and I'm just now starting to input the revised scores. In fact, I think um, I inputted some erroneous scores because I was thinking about the extra credit the wrong way. Ah, not a surprise, but I'll get that done. And then when I am done, I'll probably send you all a note asking you to make sure that I didn't mess anything up because that's kind of important, right? Um, and then also, I think I owe you some extra credit points for the quiz, for quiz two, but I'll double check that. Um, all right, so I'm going to jump in with uh, my handy, or actually no, before I jump in with my handy dandy, um, uh, I can say it, uh, tablet, uh, I want to share my screen. So let me know if you don't see our, uh, our classroom, uh, sorry, our classroom, our canvas, uh, page, um, there are a couple of items that I think might be of use to you. Uh, one is um, the um, class meeting notes, which, um, as you know from last week, I, I used uh, a tablet, you know, whiteboard to write out derivations um, um, and make some. And then prior to that, we were doing some work on uh, truth tables and so forth. So. All of that, all that whiteboard stuff is in a, a document here. Uh, and then if we continue on, we will see, let me move this over. Okay. If you continue on, um, the, we've got a little bit of a, a little bit of a, we've got a, a, a tutorial on our definitions for negation conjunction and uh, disjunction. And then um, the next page is uh, devoted to rules and strategy sheets. And so this, what the document I'm about to show you, and then we'll add to it and generate another document when we get to our last set of rules, is um, called our Boolean derivation rules. And I'm just gonna download it and open it in a new window. This doc, and you can make your own, obviously, but if you want to download this doc, this is like your new best friend. <laughs> I My advice is you have this doc with you when you're working through proofs because it's like, it's like a security blanket. You're going to know these rules backward and forward, but just having them with you to consult, um, it just to you know, confirm that you're correct is a really good thing. So that is available to you. Um, and so let me go back out to our home page because I just want to show you when we, when we're here, right under handouts and so forth, that's where we've got our notes, our, our rule sheet and I'll keep, you know, adding to it. Uh, and then the last animal that I wanted to show you is the additional practice, uh, with the, the Boolean operators. So, um, you might just, and there's a key, right? So you might decide that you want to work the practice while you've got the key right next to you because sometimes looking at the answer as you're working helps you see kind of the, the strategy employed. Um, or maybe you want to work the, the practice first and then look at the key. 
Um, note though that the key is um, written by hand using a, a whiteboard because it's actually just much faster than um, you know working it by way of a Word document. That said, we will look at some uh, formatting that uh, is easy to do in Word um, and that in fact our author uses at various points when you're working in Canvas for a quiz or an exam. So I wanna make sure that you're aware of, of uh, how you can work in, in Word or similar program um, and then also how you can work by hand. Okay, so um, do you have any questions, problems, confusions about this um, uh, basically housekeeping stuff? Don't be shy. Okay, so uh, what I am going to do is um, get us going on some practice. So um, Berman asked an awesome question. Um, thank you. It gives us a chance to revisit the idea. And, and Julianne is just joining us. So so this will be um, this will be new to her too. So all of the handouts that I mentioned the class meeting notes, the uh, tutorial on our first set of Boolean rules, um, the rule sheet, that's your new best friend, and the additional practice, those are all um, linked in the under the module, handouts, additional practice materials, and retests. Oh, speaking of retests, I need to start writing those so that if you want to retest, you can. Um, also, let me just come back to the initial um, where I started initially, which has to do with the um, uh, the extra credit points on exam one. If, um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. But again, I should be done with that no later than tomorrow. That's my plan anyway, fingers crossed, okay? Um, so no, no problem, uh, Berman, I'm glad you found it, that's great. Um, so, so what, what we're doing this week is we're just drill, drill, drilling and drilling some more, but we also want to chat as we're working about what our rules mean. So, so we already know, for example, from last week and, uh, even from the, the previous two weeks ago, from, from the week before that, that, um, the rules that we're learning are, um, are based on truth definitions for each of our operators. So if you understand what it means for a conjunction to be true, if you understand what it means for a disjunction to be true, if you understand what it means for a uh, negation to be true or false, then you grasp the relevant intro and a limb rules, right? So just as a, a quick review, and then we'll, we'll um, talk about, or actually, where did I do? Yeah, here it is. We'll, we'll then go into practice. Um, so remember that a conjunction is true when and only when, so it's true if and only if uh, each of the conjuncts is true. So when you're given or you've derived a conjunction, you can dismantle it, or you can pull the left side down, pull the right side down. Similarly, if you've got somewhere in your proof, some old sentence P, some old sentence Q, and it doesn't matter what order they appear in, you can conjoin them, right? So the elim, the intro, um, is made possible by the uh, truth definitions for the operators, okay? Um, now, one of the uh, important um, strategy rules is disjunction elimination. In fact, I was just chatting with somebody earlier about this um, rule. I was reading some article last night where, you know, just an ordinary prose form, uh, the author said something like, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna mess it up, but it's something like, look, you know, either the government is completely incompetent or, you know, totally uh, uh, irresponsible about what, you know, the, the, the population, what the citizens want, 
you know, but in either case, you know, there, there's, it's, it's a big screw up, right? That's clearly a proof by cases, the formal structure of which is disjunction elimination. Now, why do we set up the two subproofs? Typically they're successive, one immediately following the other, and they're always on the same line, if you will. They're not, it's not the case that one is indented and the other isn't. Um, but it's because a disjunction can be true in three ways. So when we're given a disjunction or we've derived a disjunction, but um, we, you know, we, we don't know which of the three ways the disjunction is true, we say, oh, okay, well, let's assume one side, derive what we want, assume the other side, derive what we want, and exit the subproof and say, look, I've just proven that in either case, I've got the sentence that I want, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, we know that a disjunction is true when at least one of the disjuncts is true, Hence, if I have some sentence P, I have P or whatever I want to say, okay? Just before moving on, does this ring bells? Does this make sense? How is everybody doing? Yeah, the and the limb and intro makes sense. I wish I would have uh, used this earlier. Well, don't worry, because um, you'll have a chance to use it again. Um, there's, so, so here's what I have in mind. Um, you know, please let me know if what I have in mind just doesn't work for you. Um, but I had in mind the following. If you start, you know, wrestling with the rules on your own and, you know, per the, the textbook, you know, you maybe write out your own rule sheet, something like that, um, then, you know, you really start to make them your own. Um, which is the way to go uh, in terms of really solidifying your knowledge. S then once you get the rule sheet, it's basically just a handy dandy good friend that you want to have with you. You know, arguably your best friend ever when it comes to, you know, reminding yourself about, about uh, rules. Um, the, it should not be the case except for extra credit, I think in exam one, it should not be the case that, you know, you uh, are doing, you know, really serious proof work uh, in a quiz or on an exam yet, such that, you know, it's, you know, you're sad you don't have the, you, what did I say? You shouldn't have already been doing any serious proof work yet. That's what I meant to say. Uh, so that, you know, having the rule sheet now is, is good timing. But, you know, again, tell me if my, if, if that, if my thinking about this does, didn't work for you. Um, all right, so notice before we move into talking about these bad boys, notice that the two strategic rules are disjunction elimination and negation intro, which is to say the two strategic rules are ways for you to structure a derivation. So, you know, you'll look at your premises, you'll look at your conclusion, you'll say, okay, given that this is what I'm going for, and given that this is what I have, which, how should I structure this thing, right? So what should I assume? What strategy should I enlist? And I believe, and we'll work on this more today, that um, if the idea of working backward uh, is uncomfortable for you, enough practice with negation intro and then eventually when we see our last two rules or sorry our last two connectives the propositional logic rules for the conditional and the biconditional you'll also see the benefit of working backward um because they the the negation intro rule really um uh forces that um notice also that the negation intro rule uh, involves generating a contradiction. So it's important that we know what it means to generate a contradiction, right? So um, there are multiple ways you can generate a contradiction. What the contradiction intro rule uh, stands for, though, is a truth functional contradiction, right? So here's a non-truth functional contradiction, uh, you know, uh, Mia is tall, Mia is short, right? Um, relatively, I'm tall, relatively, I'm short, but you wouldn't say I'm both tall and short, right? You'd think that would be contradictory or you would say um, that, that at, the, at the very least, right, 
um, you wouldn't say in the same person they're both tall and short. But there's no connective going on there, so it's not a truth functional contradiction. Okay. Um, so how does um, negation elim work? Well, wherever we've generated or we've been given two negations, we can pull them off, right? We know this because, let's go back to our truth table, uh, to a sentence that's doubly negated is truth functionally equivalent to the self-same sentence without the two negations, right? When we want to uh, generate a negation, so, so we're not, you know, notice that we're in introducing a single negation. When we want to generate a negation, we uh, uh, work by assuming that the sentence that we want to achieve is not the case. So that's, in this case, any old sentence in the universe P. And from that assumption, we generate a contradiction. And that means that this sentence can't be true. Now, remember last week, um, one way, or the, the way that I uh, introduced the negation was in terms of what's known as an indirect truth table. Some people like it, most people don't. But I do think it's worth, um, remembering the, the truth table so that you can use that as a way of thinking about negation intro. So um, recall the, the following. When you know your argument is valid, right? And I'm thinking, okay, so your premises entail the conclusion. You know your argument is valid and you look at the truth table and the truth table shows it exhibits validity because there's no row of the truth table on which uh, uh, the conclusion is false while the premises are true. You can have various combinations of truth values, right? So you can have all true premises and a true conclusion. You can have all false premises and a false conclusion. You can have combo deals. The only thing you can't have and won't have when the argument is valid is true premises and a false conclusion. So if you say, by way of the negation intro rule, hey, conclusion, I don't believe that you're valid, which, it, uh, sorry, I, I misspoke. Uh, hey, argument, I don't believe that you're valid. Conclusion, I don't believe that you must be true. In fact, I'm gonna assume that you're false. So you assume your conclusion is not the case that then means you will generate a truth functional contradiction, right? Some, somewhere above, right, uh, if you're going to say that that conclusion is false, you're going to get some contradiction, some truth fun functional contradiction between the premises, right? And then that allows you to exit the subproof. And remember, you always must exit or discharge the subproof um, and then assert uh, outside the subproof the uh, um, sentence that you want. In this case, you're introducing the negation. And like I said before, remember the contradiction is a truth functional one. Some sentence P and not P. Some sentence P and its negation. Last item that um, we, you know, I mentioned that we needed to talk about in terms of substance is the contradiction in limb rule it oftentimes feels like we're cheating when the moment we generate a contradiction, um, if we're not, if we haven't set up negation intro, then immediately after the contradiction, we assert whatever sentence we want. It's like, oh, I feel like I'm cheating. But think about it this way. Remember, if you know that the assumption of true premises yields a necessarily true conclusion as a result of those true premises, right? So the true premises entail the conclusion. Then if there is a contradiction somewhere, right? In other words, if there is one sentence that's uh, true and it's negation, then that means that in your uh, premises and all of the animals that lead to the conclusion, right? 
there uh, is at least one sentence, one premise that is false, right? And if there's one sentence that is false, that means that the, con the sentence that you uh, s assert next after the contradiction can be anything you want. It, you know, we're saying it's true, right? In other words, um, the only permutation of values you can't have, remember, is all true premises and a false conclusion. So once you've generated a contradiction, the, the conclusion can be any, anything you want in, in terms of it being true or false. Obviously, in a derivation, we're thinking about forcing uh, the conclusion. Okay? Um, so if you want to talk more about contradiction elimination or the idea of from a contradiction, anything follows, um, let's certainly do that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if my articulation of it was as, you know, concise as could be. I tend to be verbose. So, you know, if you felt like you got a little bit lost there, um, either, you know, tell me to repeat something or to rephrase something, uh, or we can find another way into it. Uh, you also know that just as a matter of uh, tautology, um, reiteration of uh, a sentence is um, uh, used as a rule simply because you're simply simply because you're just reasserting a sentence that's already taken as true. Okay, so like I said, this is a, a good friend to have with you, right? Um, but for the, for the sake of the practice that we want to do, um, I'm going to um, share my whiteboard on my tablet, which means that that roll sheet is not going to be um, uh, on my desktop or, you know, on the, uh, the share. So bear with me for just a second. Um, also, while I'm opening this up, if you have questions, problems, confusions, please, please, please let me know. Um, here's my... Come on, Mia. You can do it. Here it is. Okay. Coming in. All right, share content, whiteboard. Uh, Join the meeting. All right, Get, bear with me for just a sec because I want to make sure that I can, that we're all up here. We don't need, wait, so I'm missing Jennifer disappears when I do that. I'm trying to get rid of me, but oh well. Okay. All right. So um, first, is there an exercise, uh, let's say, from the um, uh, additional practice that I posted that you want to go over? Uh, is there any example, let's say, from the text uh, from our text that you want to go over. And if not, then I'll just go ahead and um, start grabbing some exercises. What do you think? How are you doing? I'm also hopeful that we won't run out of tablet battery. We did last last week. Okay, so you, you want to just jump right in. Then we're going to do it. Um... I'm gonna write out the premises and then I wanna say a little something about formatting um, that I hope will be useful to you. So um, we have a sentence that we've seen before. 
oops, sorry, forgive me, wrong notation, that we've seen before when we were looking at truth tables and, we, and specifically when we were uh, looking at distribution of uh, conjunction, distribution of the disjunction, um, uh, and showing how the distribution yields uh, truth functionally equivalent sentences. So, and then I'm just going to put off to the side of this premise a slash behind which uh, we are going to get the, uh, or behind which we're going to um, write the conclusion. So we want... Sorry, there's a, hold on just a sec. I've got to turn off notifications because notifications keep cropping up. Off. Okay, let's see how that works. Okay, so the, the premise reads as follows. Either it's A and B or it's A and C. Therefore, it's A for sure and either B or C, okay? Now, um, the question we want to ask is this, how do we set things up given that what we want to have is this? So let me work backward a little bit from the conclusion. So presumably, if I can get A somewhere in my proof, and I can get B or C somewhere in my proof, I can conjoin them, right? So now I have to ask myself, well, how am I going to get A? Well, let's think about it this way. If I have the sentence, oops, oopsie, oopsie. And by the way, please, as I'm talking through this, stop me with questions, problems, confusions, okay? It's, it's really important, particularly because, you know, we're not in the same physical space together. Um, and so, you know, the, the ways that we see each other, we, we can't. And it has nothing to do with the fact that I don't see you, um, uh, that you're not on camera. That's not it. Even if you were on camera, it, it would be hard in this sort of environment to kind of gauge how things are going. So don't be shy about sending up the alert, right? Verbally say something or I've got the chat box open, chat. Okay, so the question is, how am I going to get A? Well, um, I can derive A from A and B and I can derive A from A and Oops, did it again. And I can derive A from A and C, right, by conjunction elimination. But the problem is right now, uh, the two sentences in question are nested in a disjunction, right? So I can't get to these. until I deal with the disjunction, right? Because as we know, the disjunction is the main operator, right? So is my language making sense? You know what a main operator is? Is my language making sense? Hey, I can't get to the conjunction to eliminate what I want because the conjunction is nested uh, in parentheticals on either side of a disjunction, right? How are we doing? What do we think? So what I'm gonna have to do then, and I'm gonna highlight this disjunction, I'm gonna have to address this disjunction. Now, formatting issue. Um, the typical way, if we're writing by hand, for example, that we set up a subproof is by indenting the sequence, right? And we say, okay, I uh, assume A and B, 
And then what I want ultimately is the conclusion A and B or C. Then I assume A and C. Again, what I want is A and B or C so that I can get back out onto the main line and conclude, look, in either case, I have, I've just shown, I've demonstrated, in either case, I have A and B or C. Now, going back out onto the so-called main line, we can highlight as follows. I don't do it in the practice that I posted. Sorry, there's a phone ringing. Hold on. Okay, so I don't do it in the, the um, practice that I posted, but you can think of this black line as the main spine or main line. And then the indentation is um, beginning, begins at line two. Um, ho ho hold on just a sec. There's talking in the background that's really not good. Nace? Can you move at some point so that I don't hear your conversation? It's actually a press. What's hissing? Oh, all right. Sorry, everybody. I was talking and the instant pot. Okay, so, um, you know, this is what you're seeing is one way to show that we've got our main sequence and to show that we've made an assumptive proof. That said, we could just as easily do what we see in our text um, when it's difficult. For example, if, you're, if you see the, um, and you've seen an extra credit, one of the proof exercises, where be, given the restrictions of the Canvas quiz writing program, you know, we can't make these lines. So here's what it looks like. A and B or A and C. And then at line two, there's this, the vertical bar, right? Which you guys taught me the, the, that nomenclature. The vertical bar, and then we say A and B. And then we assert, so we know what, what we've just done, assume and we can be even more specific, assume disjunction elim, right? Although our text doesn't require that you do that. Then at line three, you're still in the subproof, right? Okay, so before I go back up to this top uh, version, what do we think? How are we doing? What questions, problems, confusions do we have? Do not be shy. Sing out. I want to know what you're thinking. Remember, one of the big issues that we face is this. We can say, yeah, I see it, Mia. I follow it. I get it. But then when you go to do it yourself, you get a bit stuck. And remember, it's normal and natural. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, you're going to get it. It's going to be fine. But if you only watch um, and you don't, you know, actively practice, the things things get rough. So we're going to do some practice together. I mean, I'm going to walk you through some. We're drilling, but then we're going to work together. OK, um, I do want to know because I have a little plan for us to break out into a couple of groups to work and then I'm going to go back and forth. I do want to know if you're uncomfortable working in a small group. Because if you're uncomfortable working in a small group, I don't, I don't want to force that on you, okay? All right, so here we are. We're coming back up here. Um, we say, okay, uh, I have A and B. I'm going to eliminate. Now, I could eliminate B if I prefer. That's fine. It's not a problem. But I'm choosing to eliminate A. Um, so I'm going to say from line two by conjunction elimination, I've derived A. Now I'm going to, um, uh, thank you, Berman. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, eliminate the right side of the conjunction from two. Then I'm going to 
introduce the disjunction that I need, right? So that I've got the sentence B and C. Remember we said this was the plan, right? So now from line four, I'm introducing the uh, disjunction sentence. And here I can move this down a little bit so it's prettier. And now I'm in a position to conjoin A and B or C. So that's lines three and five conjunction intro. Okay. Now when you're done with one of your disjunction elimination sequences, you end the subproof and typically you immediately start the next, right? So 99 times out of 100, that's what you do. And remember, part of what we're doing here is we're learning the machinery of a closed system. And it is going to, not by itself, um, you know, change our lives. Why? Because the reality is, you know, we don't run around focusing all of our arguments and nor does anybody else on Boolean connective arguments and that's it, right? I mean, we could, but we don't. And so, you know, we, we but what we get by, by hammering away at the machinery of the system and mastering the system is we get some awesome strategic thinking skills that go everywhere with us, right? So you don't have to be a pre-law, you know, major uh, or a philosophy major in order to see the, the benefit in all other aspects of your life to the, to the formal logic, uh, the study of formal logic. Okay. And I mentioned that not because I'm trying to make a pitch for logic, but I genuinely, I mean, I, I am one of the beneficiaries of the training, right? I I've told you before that I'm not, you know, I did not grow up in an environment where, you know, <laughs> systematic thinking was the order of the day. Okay, so we're done with our first uh, side of the ELIM. We move on to the second. So here again, sorry, so assume up here, disjunction ELIM. We're going to say the same here. Assume disjunction ELIM, right? We're going to do the same thing. You'll notice that when you have successive subproof sequences, which is what a disjunction elimination proof, subproof is, it's a successive subproof sequence, the two sequences mirror each other, right? Almost invariably. They're, they're either a direct or incredibly close um, mirroring uh, process. So it's not 710, Mia. I don't know how I got 10. 7, 8. So we're going to, again, dismantle, dismantle, uh, uh, introduce, and conjoin, okay? So so quick, either show of hands or verbal or text, uh, look at lines seven through 11. Look at lines two through six. Do you see the mirroring? Do you see the parallel? So far, so good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so now let's fill in our citations. Citations tell us where we derived a line and justifications. Justifications are the rules we used for each inference. So line eight comes from line seven, conjunction elim. Line nine comes from line seven, conjunction elim. Line 10, comes from line nine, disjunction intro. And then line 11 comes from eight and 10, conjunction intro. Once we've derived that conclusion, right? So, so we typically derive the conclusion we want in our structuring subproof. So now we get to exit and say, I've just proven that from line one, 
lines 2 through 6, 7 through 11, by uh, disjunction elimination, that in whether I have A and B or I have A and C, it follows that I have A and B or C. Okay. Are we ready? Is there anything I need to clear up conceptually, uh, skill-wise, uh, legibility of my writing? We ready to go to this other, the other format for this proof? Oh, as usual. So this will happen a lot. I run out of run out of some room here. So I'm just going to carry this over. Uh, line 10 carries over. Um, B or C, 11, still in the subproof A and B or C, 12. Now back out on the main line. Notice that I haven't put a vertical bar. A and B or C. Okay, so so the difference between these two proofs is just a matter of formatting. It's not a matter of the, the actual logic. Okay, um, confidence level. How many people are feel? And there's no right answer. How many people are are feeling ten? Say it. Type it. Do something. I want to know. Okay, seven to eight, nice. Anybody else? Who all is feeling above seven or eight? Don't be shy. Who all is feeling below seven? Okay, Julian just made a really good point. I feel in the middle, here's the here's what I take to be the really good point. Everything is familiar. Yeah, good, good, good. That's what we want, right? These are just, these are new friends. We're just getting used to them. We're getting to know them, okay? And, you know, I, I think um, Cameron and I were chatting earlier um, about, you know, the drilling. Drilling is just, it's crucial. It really is crucial. Um, it, you know, I want you to get to a point where you say, Mia, I've run out of practice. Give me more. I've run out of practice from the textbook. I've run out of practice from what you've posted. Give me more. I'll give you more. Not a problem. Um, so is everybody clear that, that the second proof, the one that's all in black with the vertical bars, that the citations and justifications are the same, right? Is everybody also clear that we could, if we want, do this? We could pull B down first and then A, right? Do the same uh, here in the second subproof, right? We could pull C down first and then A. The order, excuse me, the order of the of the conjunction eliminations is not essential, okay? What do we think? Are we ready for another one? Yes, Mia, it's the best ever. I can't wait. Come on, you know you're having fun. Yeah, we can do another one. Yay! That's right, fun. Okay, here we go. Uh, new whiteboard. All right. So how about this bad boy? Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, um, write out the derivation. Um, I'll use the, the, the uninterrupted line, right? 
Um, and then you're gonna fill in the blanks, okay? So here is the um, argument. Do I, what do I wanna do? Yeah. Um, all right, so we've got a, a, I did it again, I'm sorry. Okay, so okay. So are you, is everybody comfortable with the idea that, you know, I'm, I'm using the indentation formatting, but that, you know, if we go back to that previous whiteboard, um, right, we, in that, in the second example here, right, in this one, um, we don't indent necessarily, we just mark the um, uh, appearance of a structuring subproof with those vertical bars. Okay. All right. So, um, oops, I've got the eraser on. So assume, assume. Now you know you've got an assumption because this tiny little bar, it's typically called a Fitch bar, it says, hey, I'm demarcating or uh, alerting you to the end of the uh, premises, or in the case of a subproof, uh, a single assumptive step, which in this case is A and B, right? So your job is to fill in these blanks, okay? So if you're able to, let's do them one at a time, if you're able to type, um, please tell me where, and it doesn't matter what order you do it, you can give me the line number first or the um, rule first, but where did we get line three, which is B? So go ahead and type that in. Okay, so Jennifer says we got it from line two. And so did Julianne, beautiful guys. And you also both said that the rule that justifies it is conjunction elim. Wonderful, right? So what we did was we pulled B down from uh, A and B. How about line four? And one of the reasons why we might have trouble with the move that uh, gets you to line four is we kind of feel like it's a like a cheat. <laughs> but um, okay, beautiful work. Both Daniel and Jennifer are correct that the rule is disjunction intro. But remember that. There, the, if you look at the rule itself, it's a one line rule and you both, this is curious. So I'm really interested to know your thinking if you're willing to share, um, why you think that line one is involved. So just because C appears at, uh, line one doesn't mean that, that line one is involved in the inference. And I, can, I, I, I understand that you might be thinking that, but um, remember, yeah, exactly, Daniel. Intro, you can intro anything. So C doesn't exist anywhere in the subproof starting at line two, but it doesn't have to, right? Because you can, you're introing it from line three, okay? 
Um, but just as a reminder, the uh, uh, if you're not sure about how many lines to cite, look at your rule sheet so that you can see what's above the inference. Now, there's something else, um, and it might seem like a puny thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I confess that that Jennifer, I don't know you well enough to know why you put question marks, but Julianne, I think you put a question mark there because you, you lack confidence. Um, and it's, uh, it's unwar it's an unwarranted lack of confidence. You're good at this. Now, Jennifer, if you too lack confidence, not warranted, you guys know your stuff. And heck, even if you aren't super confident, just say it. What's the worst that can happen? You're wrong. In fact, being wrong, you know, finding out that you're wrong is awesome because then you can fix the mistake. I love it when you tell me I've done something wrong, not because I'm, I love doing things wrong, but I don't like living with mistakes and living with false beliefs. They're awful. All right, so how about line six? No question marks allowed. Awesome. Jennifer just, she nailed it. Jennifer stuck the landing. Jennifer said, look, it comes from uh, line five. Oh, wait, nope, sorry. You stuck the landing on the, on the rule. You're right that it's intro, disjunction intro. Okay. Why is it not line one though? Oh, you mistyped? What were you? <laughs> okay, good. You, what were you thinking? I mean, what did you mean to type? Perfect. All right. Awesome. Now, um, before we go to line seven, I want to, okay, before we go to line seven, I want to back up to our first proof. Here's why. When you construct your own proof and you know what you're setting up, in this case, disjunction elim, go ahead and, um, you know, give yourself enough space between your premise and the end of the, what you take to be the end of the proof, like how much space you'll need. And then write the conclusion and go ahead and assert, um, sorry, I, I underlined the whole thing. Go ahead and assert that you're setting up a disjunction -y limb from a given line number, right? That way, by the time you get to where you're going, namely the end of the proof, you've already filled it in. You just have to complete uh, filling in the, the citations. So uh, what are we uh, doing for line seven? And as a reminder, we're back on our main line, right? We're ending our subproof. So what did we set up? When we wrote assume and you look at your rule sheet, there's only one rule that has two successive subproofs, right? Beautiful. Okay, did everybody see what, what uh, Jennifer wrote? So we've got lines one, two through four, and five five to six disjunction limb. Beautiful work. Good, good, good. Okay. You ready for another one? And by the way, you know, you must send up the bat signal when you're, when you've got a question problem or confusion. Please know that what often happens, uh, it, when we're drilling together is people will say, oh, I don't want to say anything because everybody else seems to know what's going on and I feel like I'm behind. No. If you are confused, I'll guarantee you that your uh, classmates will probably have um, an explanation uh, that will help you, right? 
because I, I don't pretend to, to be able to say everything in a way that will, will work beautifully for you. So, you know, it gives your classmates a chance to articulate their thinking. And then you uh, also let us know that you want to slow things down a little bit. Okay, so Jennifer, and please, it's Mia. She can hear me. Jennifer, you want to do an example where we build a proof from a Yes. Okay. Yep. 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 Right. Okay. So does everybody see what Jennifer is after? So, um, so let's do this. And Jennifer, may I trouble you? I don't, that, that ex or that argument that you uh, have written, that is not verbatim from the text, right? Or is it? I'm just trying to think about whether or not if that's e if that's valid. Okay, so uh, here, hold on just a sec. I might as well. Oh, I see. Okay. You're not sure that it's okay. Well, let me, let me just think about it for a second. So if you do that, you have that. So, sorry, I got, I got distracted for a second. Okay. So what if we assume that and then we assume that, which gets us that which gets us that no okay good <laughs> only because i didn't think it was but then maybe i'm for all i know okay so so jennifer if memory serves right this is what you were after so let me let me erase a whole bunch of junk and now we'll work through it together okay so this is what you were after you wanted to um start with a single premise, right? And then from that single premise, you wanted to get this complicated statement. So it's not both, uh, either not this or not that, and B, right? Okay, so since we we've went ahead and 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 um, worked it to to make it valid. We say, okay, I'm assuming A. Now, strategy, a point of strategy. It's a pretty complicated conclusion, right? Well, you know that the conclusion is governed by a negation. So strategy, when your conclusion is a negation, assume that your conclusion is false. In other words, assume the argument is invalid. So in this case, I'm going to just do the vertical bars now so we can go back and forth between the two. In this case, I'm going to assume it's not the case that A or it's not the case that B and it is B. And then at line three, uh, I'm going to need to dismantle not A or not B. And then I need to immediately make a second subproof. Why? Because I've got to eliminate the disjunction. Remember, this whole process uh, for us is a process of disassembling and assembling the conjunctions and the disjunctions. It is um, the, we, we use uh, negation elim less frequently than negation intro. So it's a matter of assembling and disassembling. It's a matter of generating contradictions so that we can uh, negate the assumption that led to the contradiction, right? So here's our, our uh, second, uh, our nested subproof. We assume not A, we've got a contradiction. Fair enough. Now we move on to uh, the uh, second side of the disjunction, assume not B. Here we go ahead and eliminate the conjunction from line two. We get uh, another um, 
contradiction, right? And now we're back out onto the main assumptive proof. So we've proven the contradiction in either case, right? And that then means that our negation intro subproof is complete. Okay, now I know I went through that fairly quickly. I'm going to go ahead and color code these. So here's our negation intro subproof. That's our first assumptive step. And then this is our nested subproof. Now, don't, don't worry. I'm going to um, I'm going to rewrite this, but I'm going to erase for the moment. Okay, let's go back to strategies. We looked at our conclusion. We saw our conclusion is a negation. So we said, let's set up, and now I'm just gonna use a single line. Let's set up negation intro. So I assume my conclusion is false. Generate a contradiction so that I can exit that subproof and say, it's not the case that my assumption is true. It's not the case that line two is true, which is to say my conclusion must be true. Right? Then we started to dismantle. So we've got, you know, our assume negation intro, and then line 10, we're gonna remind ourselves what we did, negation intro, and because we already worked through it real quick, I know what the line numbers are, I'll just write them, two through nine. Okay, now we start to work our dismantling. We know that we're going to need to dismantle, right, our conjunction, and we're going to also need to dismantle our disjunction, but the conjunction has to come first. So we go ahead and dismantle the conjunction. Not A or not B. Okay. Now you could, if you want to, at line four, dismantle the B from line two. Uh, I just did it within that um, nested subproof. Uh, because it follows immediately after not be, and so that contradiction is, is you know, wildly explicit. Um, I don't know if explicitness can be wild, but in any event, right? Now we're setting up the next uh, uh, subproof. Now I've got to dismantle this disjunction, right? So I'm going to... Assume we're that we're at line four. Assume that not A is the case, and lines uh, one and four generate a contradiction. So now, right, I've I'm done. Now at line six, I'm going to uh, assert the assumptive step for the other side, right? So here's not A, here's not B, and double check. Look from your rule sheet to the derivation, your rule sheet to the derivation. Now I'm going to eliminate the conjunction, right? So I'm bringing this guy down. And then at line eight, I've got my contradiction. 
and notice what's happened. So let me go ahead and, and do a little of erasing here so it doesn't get too messy. Notice that from my assumption, right, I've derived from each side of my assumptive step, I've derived a contradiction. And so I exit disjunction elim. It's not, not very clear. Disjunction elim, three, uh, four to five, six to eight. Okay, so let me pause. Are you ready to fill in the blanks? We need to satisfy three more lines, right? So, or sorry, four, forgive me. So line four is a second assumption, right? Line six is part of that second assumptive proof. So line three, let's cite and justify. Where did we get this contradiction? Do, do you always do the subproofs on a disjunction? Because it seems like every example you break only the disjunctions into subproofs. Great question, Cameron. So what I'm about part of what I'm about to say is probably gonna sound snotty, and I swear I don't mean it this way, but here here's how it goes. When you're so when you have a disjunction. 99 times out of 100, you must eliminate it. It's the only way to get to where you want to go. And the nature of the disjunction elimination rule is these two assumptive sequences, right? So yes, because we've got a limited number of, of operators right now, you know, they're, they're, the subproofs are almost invariably going to be disjunctions. In fact, they will always, given the Boolean rules, right? they will always be either disjunction limb or negation intro. So notice here, and tell me if this makes sense to you or not, notice that here, our structuring subproof, right, is the negation intro, where we assume that the conclusion is false, we generate a contradiction, and then we get back out onto the main line, while the disjunction elim subproof is what's known as a nested subproof. So it's a, a further assumptive um, uh, proof sequence. And then if you want the line on the, on the far left, right, if you want to say, okay, well, our, here we are from line one, there's our, our only premise as, as Jennifer requested, and then our proof ends at line 10. So I don't know if that formatting helps you. So the, the nested is the disjunction and the, and the well, what's the first subproof? Is that the conjunction? The first subproof begins with... Why am I confused? I'm sorry, Cameron, say again. I was talking over you. No, no, no. What's the... Uh... Okay, so if the nested subproof is, a, is the disjunction... Then what's the first subproof? Does that um, go to the conjunction? Um, it, it is not about the conjunction, but I, I had highlighted the, the conjunction because we knew we needed to, to eliminate it. Um, but let me just move these guys over a little bit so that it's a little clearer. The structuring subproof is about your conclusions being a negated sentence, right? So do you see the difference between the conclusion, which is governed by a negation, 
and the assumptive step at line two, which is not. Yeah, you said most of the time it's disjunction or negation elimination. N negation intro. Subject. Negation what? Negation intro. Oh, intro. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's what we did. So, so this this um, this visual might be uh, easier. We said, okay, assume conclusion is false. We generated, we derived a contradiction, and then we got out and said, so the assumption is not the case. So not the case, the assumption. <laughs> Right, that's the that's the yellow is is what you see on the on the left hand side and on that vertical line. So ninety nine times out of a hundred, when we use negation intro early on like this, it is um, to show that assuming the conclusion is false can't be maintained. And that's because of the nature of validity. How are we doing? What do we think? We ready to, to cite and justify? Or justify and cite? What do we think? How did we get line three? Remember line four is an assumption. Line five is derived, uh, line six is an assumption, line seven and eight are derived, line nine is derived, and line 10 is derived. So what's the difference? Let's try this. Um, you know that line three can't come from line one because line one is the affirmed A, whereas line three uh, has A negated. So it's not line one. Take a look at line two. What's the main operator? Is it this negation, the first negation? Is it the disjunction? Is it the second negation or is it the conjunction? Jennifer, can you, I, I don't want you to, um, uh, well, actually I do want you to, 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 to get rid of that question mark. <laughs> You're right, it's an elimination, but what's the main connective? What's the main oper operator? Excuse me for hiccuping. Yeah. It can't be disjunction elim from line two, right? For two reasons. One, conjunction is the main operator. That's what you've got to dismantle. You can't just reach inside and rip out a side of a disjunction, right? Secondly, disjunction elimination requires a subproof sequence. So you're exactly right that line three is disjunction elim from line two. Beautiful. Now, we uh, move on to our first of our successive subproof sequences. We assume not A. How do we get the contradiction? What are the two contradictory sentences? And it, by the way, it's not a bad idea as you work on a, a proof, if you're doing it by hand, obviously, to, you know, check animals off as you use them. So I'm not saying you won't use line two again. In fact, you will, but check it off. You did use it once already, okay? Uh, you're in the process of, of using line three, so you're not going to justify that right now. Um, but now look at line five. It's a contradiction. 
tell me what the two contradictory sentences are. We've got contradiction intro. What are the contradictory sentences? I'll give you one of them, line one. What's the other one? Four, beautiful. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, now, uh, so, so we use line one, we use line four. How did we get, so, and we don't need to justify, we can't, by definition, justify the assumption at line six. How about line seven? Where do we get line seven? There's only one place we could have gotten it, right? Yep, Jennifer, elimination of the conjunction at line two. So we use this guy twice. Now the contradiction, once again, what do you see? Contradiction intro from what and what? Beautiful. Uh, wait a minute, what did you write? You meant to write what and six and what? So two and six are not contradictory, right? But take a look at six and seven, right? We've got not B and B. That's, that's just what a contradiction is, some sentence and its negation. Jennifer, are you okay with that? I want to make sure because you had, you had written um, two and six. Good. Okay. Uh, we've, I already, I just pulled this off to the right because of the, the last animal. Um, but look, do you see that we got the contradiction from line three, right? Uh, four through six or sorry, four through five, six through eight. So we're using everything. We'll always use everything that's given and that we derive. And then we generated the contradiction, which allowed us to get out and say that assumption is not the case. Negation, intro, two through nine. Okay. How's the confidence level? Daniel, great question. The answer is, given what we've set up, no. Notice that the contradiction ends a subproof sequence, a subproof sequence that started at line two. So if line two is true, we generate a contradiction, which means that line two can't be true. Right, so the assumption that set off, or sorry, rephrase, the assumption that yields a contradiction uh, is false. So there are two moves that you can make once you generate a contradiction. One is as you say, the other is to exit a subproof. So hold on. Um, let me go ahead and save these, and then I'm going to. Um, share my screen again with the uh the rules okay so if you are not in a negation intro subproof sequence after you generate a contradiction typically it's immediately after but it doesn't have to be but you assert the sentence that you want right because the contradiction tells us that at least one of the premises is false, which means that any sentence follows from it based on what we understand the truth functional uh, uh, nature of validity to be. However, when the contradiction is the result of this assumption, it means that this assumption can't be the case. Does that make some sense? Good, okay, good for you. All right, so let's go back.
All right, how about, how about this one? All right, so let's um, work as follows. We know that the uh, premise is the sentence, it's neither C nor D. And the conclusion is the demorganization of that sentence, right? We know that de Morgan's equivalences are sentences that have identical truth values on every row in the column under the main operator, where you either have a disjunction bound by a negation or you have a conjunction bound by a negation and the pushing through of the negation and swapping out either respectively uh, the uh, disjunction for a conjunction or conjunction for a disjunction means you've got the, the equivalent sentence. That is the resulting sentence is truth functionally the same as the premise. So the question is, well, how do we proceed? Well, remember um, one of the, the points that I made earlier was that, um, or this was quite a while ago, so I'll, I'll, it, you may not remember. Um, we love negations. We love negations because negations allow us to generate contradictions and contradictions are great ways to move a proof forward. So let's look at, the conclusion, let's work backward from the conclusion. Uh, we know that the first negation covers C alone, the second negation covers D alone. So presumably, if we had C on its own and we had D on its own, we can conjoin them. Oops, I didn't write that correctly. Right? But the question is, you know, how do we get not C on its own? How do we get not D on its own? Um, in addition, we could say, well, um, so or let me let me rephrase that. Alternatively, we could say, well, what if I instead just assumed that this conclusion is false? So I'll assume. So here's my my alternative. It's not the case that not C and not D, right? So, you know, a negation intro would yield a contradiction and then I could exit the proof and say, so it's not not, not C and not D, and then eliminate uh, the uh, two negations to yield not C and not D, right? But that, you know, strikes me on the face of it as, you know, kind of complicated, right? I'm, I'm more... I'm more uh, enamored of this of this first approach. When I look at my premise, I also notice that there's the negation that covers the the scope or sorry, rephrase. There's the negation that covers the disjunction. So, you know, here's another alternative. Uh, if I could generate the sentence C or D, then I have a contradiction, right? So then a question is, well, how might I do that, right? How am I going to generate the sentence C or D? Well, uh, maybe I get the sentence C somewhere, or maybe I get the sentence D somewhere, right? So, you know, what if I said something like this, huh? I asked how I was going to get not C and not D. What if I go ahead and assume that I have one or the other, right? Assume I have C, then I get C or D, then I get a contradiction, and then that allows me to infer that not C is the case. Ooh, goody, then I just have to do the same thing with D. Now, I'm talking through this, jotting down a few notes. Does, does it make sense as I'm sort of talking 
talking through the playing out of a strategy. So what if I do this? So, so Daniel's saying, do you assume, do you go ahead and assume that C and D are the case? The short answer uh, is no. Why? Well, here's a question. Is the sentence C and D truth functionally equivalent to the conclusion such that you you're working a negation intro now if you assume c or d right so here's some interesting thinking if you assume c or d sure you generate a contradiction but then that only brings you back to the sentence that you had already right uh sorry forgive me that just brings you back to the sentence that you had already, namely, it's not the case that C or D, right? But your thinking is on the right track. Check this out and see what, what you make of it. Okay, so let's come back here. So um, I'm just going to color code this real quick. So remember earlier I said, huh, if I could get C... And I could get, sorry, if I could get not C and I could get not D, then I could conjoin them. But the question that I had is, but how do I do that? How do I get not C, not D? Well, I could work a contradiction in, sorry, I could work a negation intro, right, by way of generating a contradiction. Right, so I'm now basically combining my brainstorming. And it's really a good idea for us to, when we're, when we're given an argument, to, to start working backward and sort of brainstorm how we might get from the end to the beginning. Because that oftentimes gives us an idea for a strategy, namely the use of a subproof. Okay, remember... Valid arguments mean that the conclusion just needs to be extracted from the premise or premises. Okay, so here's how we go. Assume C, generate C or D, which yields a contradiction, which yields, oh, sorry, wrong sentence, which yields the negation of the assumption. And now I'm gonna do the same thing, but for D, so that I can get not D. Assume D, introduce the disjunction, generate, sorry, my writing's so bad, hold on. Generate the contradiction, get back out, And now I get my conjunction. Okay, so assume, assume, so remember Go back to the, the two animals that are circled so that you can see your way forward. Talk to me about line three. Where did we get it? Don't be shy. 
I don't understand why you didn't just introduce a, a negated C on line three. Um, so Cameron, in order f for me to, for us to do that, we need to either make a further assumption that not C is the case or derive not C from somewhere. Does that make sense? And am I addressing your, your question? Yeah. For some reason, this one just threw me off. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know why I think it might have thrown you off, and, and, and at least if our thinking is similar, um, because you're working two separate negation intros, it it's like, wait, I, I need to derive one part of, of my conclusion, and then I and then later I derive the other part, and then I can join them. I mean, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. So does everybody see that line 10 comes uh, from four and five conjunction intro? Right? Line nine comes from six through eight negation intro. We love our contradictions. We're always looking for a contradiction. Line eight comes from one and seven contradiction intro. Seven comes from six by disjunction intro. Five, once again, you know, these are, th these are not the, these are two iterations. These two subproofs are two iterations of the same rule. Um, and because they're attempting to do the same thing, um, you're going to get the mirroring like we tip, like we typically see with the disjunction elim. So here again, we've got negation intro. This time it's two through four negation intro. And uh, sorry that earlier I didn't put a little line under here. I didn't. I, that was my bad. Another contradiction, right? One and three contradiction intro. Line three from line two disjunction intro. What do you think? Now, Julianne, are you, can you say, yeah, okay, so Jennifer, yes, three is, is or intro, disjunction intro from two. Um, Julianne, the or intro, disjunction intro from one, um, I think what you might be seeing is that, you know, nested in this parenthetical, there is the sentence C or D. But remember, um, the, the, the negation is what governs that sentence. So we don't be, we're not able to just pull the C or D sentence out of line one. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. So no. 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 Um, you know, you 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 can't just go in and grab it because you want it. Um, remember, you gotta you gotta deal with the. I'm so glad you mentioned this because this is such an important point. Um, you gotta deal with whatever is the main operator. Okay. Really good. Good for you. All right. Are we ready for another? How are we doing? Your tote's loving it. I can tell. All right, this one will be a little longer. So let me just bring a new page up. Um, oops, I'm in the eraser. All right, so how about this? Uh, D or E and F. Not 
not E or not. Oh, sorry, sorry, did it again. Not E or not F. Um, or G. And then our conclusion is D or G. Okay. So once again, uh, when we peruse our argument, we see almost entirely, or sorry, we see that the argument is almost entirely governed by uh, disjunctions. So you're going to say, huh, disjunction is, is what we want. Like disjunction elimination, sorry, is what we want. Um, you might also think, as you look at the conclusion, oh, if I could just get D, then I could introduce G. Alternatively, if I have G, I could just introduce D, right? And you look at your, um, let me just make sure I'm not missing something, so... Okay, so that should be right. Anyway, um, so so when you look at what you want, D disjunction G, you see that you know D does appear in line one and G appears in line two. So in order to get at them, you're gonna need to eliminate the disjunctions. Now you might say, oh, how do I know which one to do first? Should I set up disjunction elimination where you know my First uh, one is, or where I where my structuring subproof sequence is uh, uh, determined by line one, where I assume the left side, right, get what I want. Then I assume the right side, get what I want, and get out, knowing full well that I'm going to have to eliminate this. Um, double disjunction somewhere, right, as a nested subproof sequence, or is it the case that I set up the sequence such that it's not E, right, that is my, um, uh, sorry, rephrase, I said not E, such that it is the, the disjunction sequence in line two that drives the thing, knowing again full well that I'm going to still need at some point to uh, dismantle line one, right? There's no way for me to get uh, line, uh, sorry, there's no way for me to get the conclusion from the assumption not E. That's just not going to happen. So I, I'm going to need to uh, dismantle line one in order to help me. Why? Because, ooh, my, my favorite, look, contradiction. Look, contradiction. We love those, right? So you're working backward as you are working forward. Now, do you have a preference? Do you want to set up disjunction elimination where the conclusion of the argument is the goal, right, of each of the subproof sequences? Uh, by the by line two or by line one doesn't matter you're gonna have to deal with both one might be more efficient than the other maybe not somebody choose disjunction elimination from line one as our structuring our strategic subproof sequences or Disjunction elimination from line two is our strategic uh, subproof sequence. Someone must choose. <sighs> choose, 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 choose. Wait, are there two premises on this one? Yes. Right, so premise one says it's D or E and F. Premise two says either it's not E or it's not F or it is G. So the question is, which of the disjunctions are we going to use to structure our proof? The disjunction at line one 
for the two disjunctions from line two. We're going to have to eliminate both line one and line two, but which one do you want to use as your structuring subproof? I like the first one because it's shorter. There you go. All right. So we're going to assume D. What is it that we want? We don't know how long it's going to take, so we'll just, you know, or actually rephrase. Uh, it takes two seconds on this one. We just introduced the disjunction, right? Um, but on the second one, we assume E and F, and now we're in a bit of a sticky wicket, right? Because there's no way for us to get from E and F to D or G, right? So that's what we want, D or G, so that we can exit the subproof and say, look, in either case, I've got D or G, right? That's our goal. Right? So, oops, sorry, I messed that up. Right, so here's one subproof and here's the other. Now, you can uh, dismantle the conjunction at line five or you can wait But does it make sense that you're going to need to eliminate? And when and when we set up our our um, our blueprint, our template, our framework, we sometimes have to go back and and uh, or we have to erase because we haven't made enough space. Right? So does it make sense that for each of our um, sequences, we yield, we end with the uh, sentence D or G? Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to color code, okay? And I'm going to color code, uh, or sorry, I'm going to go back and I'm going to color code. You're going to tell me if the color coding helps or not. Um, sometimes I, I've been doing, sometimes I've done it, sometimes I haven't. Let's, you know, some people uh, find it very helpful. So let's see what you think. Some people don't care. Some people might find it distracting. Okay, it's, it, what's important is that you're comfortable with what we're doing. Uh, okay, so I've lost my, there we go. All right. So it was not E or not F or G. Okay. And then Cameron said, which I which I think is a is a is a nice strategic move. Cameron said, let's use line one as our structuring subproof. Oops. Okay, so, um, here we go. We'll number six. Uh, I'm. You, we're gonna fill in what we're gonna do uh, in a moment. Seven, eight, nine. I need to make a bit more room here. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 
and then back on the main line, 16. So Cameron told us already that line 16 is a disjunction elimination sequence, starting with line one. And then since we've laid out the numbers that we'll take, two, uh, sorry, sorry, rephrase, not, not two. Line one and then three to four and five to 15. And then we need to uh, account for our assumptive steps. So we assume disjunction limb, assume disjunction limb. Now let's look at our, our nested subproof sequence sequences. We've got not E, right? So that's the far left of the disjuncts, the far left of the disjuncts at line two. So assume, what are we assuming? Well, um, uh, oops, I, ma I made a mistake. Hold on, sorry. What are we assuming? Let me finish that up. Uh, we're assuming a disjunction elimination. And uh, sorry about that. Uh, it's not line one. That goes last. Uh, forgive me. That's the elimination from uh, line two. Um, maybe I should make, put that in. I should put that in green. Disjunction elim two uh, six to nine ten to thirteen. Oops. And fourteen to fifteen. Okay, sorry about that. And then um, we're back out on the main line. Line 17 gets us D or G. Now we can say disjunction limb, one, three to four, and uh, five to 15. I do that all the time. I forget to um, exit out of the, the second subproof. Okay, so um, we need to account for the following moves. Right, we need line seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen. Right, so first is the structure clear? How are we doing? What do we think? Is everybody clear that what's in black involves the sequence that begins that that sorry that line one sets off and that the green involves the sequence that sequences that line two sets off. In fact, heck, do this. <laughs> okay. Line four, source and rule. What are they? Thank you, Daniel. Three, disjunction intro. Good, good, good. Um, so six is an assumption. Line seven. Sorry, my um, numbers are all wonky pants. And wonky pants, yes, is a very technical term.
I think I'm, no, I'm not numbering wrong. Okay, wrongly. Okay. What do we write at line seven, right? So there are two, two lines here that need to be dealt with. We need to say what they are. We need to say where they got, where they, where we got them and what justifies them. Good. So, uh, line seven, um, Daniel says is the sentence E. Sorry, that was really ugly. Uh, e, it comes from um, conjunction elimination. Oh, wait, you didn't seven. Oh, I see. So, Daniel, the only thing you didn't say is where line seven comes from, but it, it comes from five and it's conjunction elim. Daniel, you're exactly right that line eight is a contradiction from six and seven. Really good. And then, yep, you got it, good for you. And then line nine is from line eight, the elimination of the contradiction. And now we're basically going to do the same thing again, right? So talk to me about line uh, 11. Go get it. What's line 11? What do we write? What do we cite? And what? how do we justify? And if anybody's feeling a bit sort of overloaded by, by visual clutter, you know, don't be shy about um, pulling stuff off to the side. So, you know, not F is an assumption. We know we love contradictions. So how are we going to get a contradiction? Well, we've got E and F, right? If we derive F, now we've got a contradiction, right? Pull things off to the side um, because it'll make it easier for you to see the sort of the tactical moves, right? So F comes from line five, conjunction elim. Contradiction is generated from lines 10 and 11. And then the uh, elimination, sorry, that looked ugly. Let me make it clearer. And then line um, 13 comes from line 12. It's the elimination of the contradiction at uh, line 12. All right. And then take a look at three and four and now look at 14 and 15. Look at three and four, look at 14 and 15. Are you, are you starting to notice that you're doing the same stuff over and over and over again, just in different configure, you know, with different elements, right? And then you've already completed the rest. It's good work. Okay, I need uh, confidence levels from you folks.
confidence level, who's feeling really good, who's feeling kind of good, who's feeling not so good. Okay. Seems to me like, um, yeah, the, the, the folks who have, who have, have been speaking up, um, I think that it seems like things are going pretty well. Um, de there's, we definitely want to, you know, to keep drilling. So if you haven't tackled the additional practice in from the text, and if you haven't tackled the additional practice that I posted, definitely do that. And don't be shy, right, about saying, Mia, I want more, I want more, okay? I have no problem uh, with, with making sure more is uh, uh, available. And yeah, Julianne, that, that's kind of, that typically is how it, how it goes. Um, but again, I'm not saying that you wait from one week to the next to work on it. I know you don't. I know you work on it throughout the week. Um, but just, you know, try to, to, to keep drilling, drilling, drilling. Um, let's do one more if you're up, if you're game. How about Oh, no, I want to do black. Okay. Okay. So when you look at this argument, so you've got your two premises and this is your main line, right? So two premises to the right of your second premise is your conclusion. When you look at what you're given, you want to the, the following should, should jump out at you, although not in any particular order. You want to go, oh, look, I've got a contradiction. I just need to make it explicit. How can I get Q and not Q on their own? Well, um, talking about getting Q and, uh, sorry, yeah, getting Q on its own, um, that means, you know, I'm going to need to dismantle. Q is going to have to be a, um, have to be an assumption, right? which means I also need to get P, right? You might also say that uh, the way to get not Q on its own is, oh yeah, I've got a, I've got a conjunction. So that means that I'm going to need to dismantle uh, not Q, right? Or sorry, yeah, dismantle not Q so that I can uh, get generate a, the contradiction that I said I wanted. Right, so we love contradictions. They're our friends. Make sure this is long enough, right? And then also notice that P is the conclusion, right? So um, that's going to be the goal of each of the of the subproofs. You might also look at your conclusion and see that it is uh, a simple sentence. Here's another bit of strategy for us. Um, whenever a sentence is simple, we can, uh, we can use negation intro anytime, but when a sentence is simple, negation intro is a great way to go. So that would mean I could do something like this, assume that P is not the case, generate a contradiction, get out, right? So question for you, which way do you want to go? Do you want to work uh, disjunction intro or do you want to work negation intro? Choose. A 
I'll just hang out. Come on, somebody choose. Do it, do it, do it. Disjunction elim, negation intro. Disjunction elim, negation intro. Disjunction elim, negation intro. Disjunction elim, negation intro. I'll just stay it all night long. Do the number two. Do the do number two. Number two meaning the second one, negation intro? Yeah. All right. Cameron has spoken. You're welcome. <laughs> Oops. Okay. So this is a negation intro. And this is our assumptive step. Okay. Now. Here's what's cool. We've got potential contradictions. We need to make them explicit. So how do we do that? Well, assume P is the case. Assume Q is the case. Eliminate the uh, negated Q. Generate the contradiction. Boom, you're done. Let me move these over a little bit. What do you think about that? Now that was really fast, right? But I want to know how you felt about about that did you go yep i see it yep i see it yep i see it and if you didn't you know i want to know we need to we want to talk about that Did I miss a number? Hold on. Okay, so so one, two, three, four. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you, Cameron. So one, four to five, six to eight. And then negation intro is always a single uh, subproof, so that's three to nine. And then we eliminate the negation at ten. That's a little cutie, right? Okay, let's work it the other way now. So here, right, so here we worked as follows. We said, all right, we're taking the disjunction and using that as the structuring subproof, right? So, but it, you know, it doesn't matter as long as you get to where you want to go and you do it legally, you do it, you know, validly it, you're fine to, um, whoops, you're fine to use either, uh, um, 
structuring subproof. Right, so we assume, assume, what did we assume? Well, let's say it at the end here. We assume disjunction elim from line one, lines three to four, and five to eight, right? And then in between, we've reiterated, we have eliminated a, the conjunction. We have introduced the contradiction and then eliminated the contradiction. So one of the things that's important, um, and I'm glad, Cameron, that you that you chose uh, a sequence, is this. Is like I said, as long as you get to where you want to go correctly, there may be multiple ways to go. So so for now, you know, capitalize on whatever kind of feels mentally like the best fit for you, right? So there was a period where. I hated disjunctional limb. I don't know why, but I did, right? And then, you know, after a while of just doing, like being beaten to death, <laughs> pretty much with the, with, you know, doing the, the proof sequences over and over. I'm like, no, now I see there's a value and this is how I can make sense of it, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I stuck for a long time with what was most comfortable for me. And that was not a bad thing, right? Because it allowed me to gain a level of proficiency that I might not have, have gained as quickly otherwise. And remember, I was quite slow at this. So, you know, give yourself credit. We're doing this in, a, in an environment where, you know, we don't get to be in the same room and, you know, I can see kind of how you're doing and so forth. So um, it's, you know, g give yourself time to get it. All right. What do you think? You did good work. Is there anything else you want to cover now? Do you believe that you, you've got everything you need for the, um, the Boolean derivation process? It's now just a matter of, of practicing. Um, one of the things you should feel free to do is this. Um, if you can make an office hour and you just want to practice, like I, I, I do this all the time when I'm actually on campus, people will come to the office and I'm busy doing my thing and they're doing, they're practicing, they're doing their thing. And when they have a question, they'll say, Hey, me, I have a problem. I have a question or whatever. And then I'm like, Oh, okay, here we go. And then we, and then we talk and then we go back to doing our own thing. There's no reason why we can't do that in the uh, the video classroom environment where you come into my, instead of video classroom, it's video office, right? Come into office hours and you say, I don't want to talk to you, me, unless I have a problem. Okay, fine. Do your own thing. And right. And, and we can, we can work on things together as you need to. Some people like that because they feel like if I have a question, I can get it answered right away. Cause I, and I recognize it can be frustrating not to be able to have a, an, a question answered right away. Um, if you say, oh, I love that idea, or I like that idea, but I, I just don't have, I can't make it to your office hours, don't worry, we can set aside other time. That's not a problem. So, so some people just, you know, especially as we get more involved in the derivation process, you know, people, they just pile into the office and it's like a workshop for, you know, however long office hours last. So, you know, use, the, you know, think about that as a potential option. Um, but... I, there's nothing I'm really dying to, to show you. I think that we've got, you know, the, the basics of our, of our skill set um, requirements out there. So it's really just a matter of, of practice. Okay. Questions, problems, confusions. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to make sure that I save all these. And yeah, and then I'll post them 
under our our class uh, under that module for like handouts and so forth. It'll be under the link for um, class notes. Uh, I mean, this is more of a workshop, not notes, but still, I'll, that's where I'll post them. All right, folks. I'm going to sign off unless there's something you want to talk about. Don't be shy. Thank you, Berman. And oh, Berman, it's it's Mia. So so practice with that. All right, folks, um, if I don't see you this week, I will see you next week and we'll continue on our fun fest. You did good work. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for everything. All right. Bye.